Today I thought you might be interested in taking a look at a basic set of hand tools, punches, chisels, things like that, and to do that I wanted to experiment with some flutagon. We've looked at flutagon in the past, but the tools I made out of it weren't everyday tools, and I want to make a set that are the tools I'm going to use day in, day out at the anvil, so I can really put this steel to the test. Now flutagon is also known as Atlantic 33. It's a water hardening steel that doesn't need to be tempered. The final hardness and characteristics are based on what temperature you harden it at. It seems way too good to be true to me. It apparently works and it's been around for a while and a lot of people really like it. Now the flutagon gets its name because it has these flutes in the square bar. Very distinctive, you're not gonna confuse this with any other material. Now my initial experiments with the flutagon shows that just forging this into a tool may close up these flutes a little bit and result in a longitudinal cold shut in your material that could cause problems later. That could develop into a stress crack. So I think the best practice is to go ahead and square this up. Then I'm going to take it to an octagon or even go all the way to round depending on what kind of tool you're making. Now I know what you're thinking, I don't have a power hammer, therefore I can't do this. Well, you can do it, it just takes a little bit longer doing it by hand at the anvil. Completely doable, this just makes my life a little bit easier. And lately I've been overdoing it a little bit around the old homestead here. And the bursitis in my right shoulder says, you're not swinging a hand hammer for more than about a half hour any given day. And until that heals up, I'm going to use the power hammer a lot more. Now I'm going to let these bars cool, then I'll mark them to length and cut them, then we can get on with the individual tools. More of that will actually be done at the anvil as long as I can. Now you're certainly going to be tempted to cut all of these to the exact same length or exactly in half so they're very close. These aren't quite exactly the same length now, some of them are drawn out a little bit more. But when you make tools out of these, different tools are going to need different amounts of material. If you're making a wider chisel, you're going to do more spreading than you are drawing out. So it's not going to grow very much in length. On the other hand, if you're making a round punch, particularly a smaller diameter round punch, it is going to draw out a lot more because you're not spreading it. It's all a drawing out process. So that tool is going to be a lot longer than the chisel would be. So if you cut these in different lengths and kind of have an idea of what tools you're going to make, how much a tool will grow versus spread as you make it, you'll end up with a set of tools that's more consistent in their size. Not really critical, it's okay if you do it one way or the other, but it's nice if things match. This is also a good way to make an intuitive guess on how much these are going to draw out and see how close you are to being right. And you start to get an eye for that kind of stuff over the years. So personally, I think it's okay to not do all the math and all the calculations on something like this. Worst case, you can always trim the long ones down and clean the ends back up and make them all match that way. But personally, I wouldn't go through that trouble. If one's a little longer and one's a little shorter, it's going to be fine. So that'll give me a variety of lengths and we'll go ahead and cut those. And I'm just going to mark these cold at the anvil so that I can find this again when I bring them back out hot. A hardy on the anvil is the obvious choice for cutting these to length. I wanted to cut this as centered as I could because I'm going to use this one for a chisel and that already starts to establish my bevel just in the way I've cut it. The end rag will have to be filed or ground off. 
I'm going to turn this around and work on the struck end first. I just want to put a light taper on that end, help concentrate the blows down the center of the tool, and help prevent mushrooming. Once I have that taper established, I'm going to put a couple little flats in the sides of this. That helps give you a better grip, but also a tactile feel for which way the chisel is facing, so it'll help you steer a straighter line if you're cutting some sort of a long line down the center of a bar. I think I'm going to switch to this tool. It's either a well-rounded bottom block or very flat fuller. And I'll also use a rounding hammer that kind of gets in there and is the same shape. The goal, of course, is to make this as even as possible by hand at the anvil so you don't have to do any grinding on it. Time to go ahead and start working on the chisel end. This will be mostly a spreading process. I want this to be about an inch wide. To avoid damaging your hammer or your anvil, you want to work close to the edge so any overstrike is off the edge of the anvil and not hitting the anvil itself. That's exactly what I'm going for. Clean it up a little bit, make sure everything looks even. This is where a little hot rasping to remove the rag. Make sure the shape is what you want before you go to heat treat. Any final sharpening is done after that. So we're going to go back to the other end, make sure it's straight, the profile is what I want, and then we'll hot rasp the struck end. Putting just a little bit of a bevel on that to make sure there's no sharp corners that might introduce stress risers. Then my final step will be putting my touch mark on it, and I bought a special stamp that says A33, just so I know what this is in the future. If I ever need to heat treat it again, or if it has problems, I'll know what kind of steel it was that gave me the problem. Same thing holds true if it performs wonderfully, I'll know what steel performed wonderfully. I made the chisel out of the longest piece of material that we had cut previously, and I'm going to make a round punch out of the shortest piece of material just to show how material moves differently and how these will probably end up closer to the same size, even though they're not anywhere near close now. And to save my shoulder, I'm going to show how I would start this under the power hammer. It'll still need to be finished by hand at the anvil.
gets the majority of the heavy work done, I'll go to the anvil to clean it up and put the final shape in this. And of course, a little hot rasping to clean it up and get it ready to harden. Now my length on these came out almost identical. These are now ready to go ahead and harden. Usually I would say harden and temper, but the Atlantic 33 is a non-tempering steel. Still seems like magic to me. Now doing a little bit more scrounging around on the internet, I found some information on cannonballforge.com. They're also a dealer of Atlantic 33, and I'll put a link to their website down in the video description. They have a pretty good variety. They also have it in hexagonal bar, which might be nice to work with. Then you wouldn't have to forge those flutes out initially. It might save you a little bit of extra effort. But on here it says the hardening temperature is 1650 to 1950. That's a pretty big range to harden this at from a low orange heat up to a yellow heat. And that should be a little bit more foolproof for hardening. There's no reason to heat the entire tool. I don't want the struck end to be hard anyways. So I'm just going to heat and harden the working end. As that comes up to heat, I'll turn the forge off and let it soak for a little while to make sure the heat is good and even and penetrates all the way into the core of the tool. And because that wasn't heated all the way to the end, I can cool the entire thing. So that's it for the heat treating process. Now it's time to clean these up just a little bit, put the edge on the chisel, make sure the punch is nice and flat on the end, and get them ready to use. Earlier, we cut our bars off using a hot cut hardy. If you don't have a hot cut hardy, you can use a hot chisel. That's just one of the many things you can use this for. In the long run, it's probably a more versatile tool, even if it's not the thing you think of in the first place. Don't cut all the way through into your anvil. And just like cutting off on a hardy, it's a good idea not to cut all the way through if you could avoid it. I hope you have time in your day to get out to your shop. But stay safe, wear your safety glasses. We'll see you again next week.